That's who I am. Um, my hair is greyer than that picture. Esco had a part of making it grey, believe me. This is something which did not just happen by accident, it, it caused pain. All right, I shouldn't be surprising any of you with the, with the idea of an electronic system, but I mean, these are the sort of things that, uh, that surprise lots of people, and they surprise uh, politicians in particular, because they haven't really thought about many of these things. After all, a camera is a camera, a printer is a printer, a, uh, a navigator is a navigator, and music comes out of these things. I mean, they, that their electronic systems is news to a whole bunch of people. Then you recognize all of these other things that are much more intangible in the sense are still also electronic systems is even more of a surprise to them. Now, it's a message which is important to get over because if we don't succeed in persuading those people out there, the vast majority of the ordinary people out there, that electronic systems are part of their life, not just a part of their life, but fundamental to their life, fundamental to the economy, that they don't understand that what we're doing is something which is relevant to them at all. So, the British culture of failure, uh, and this is the thing which um, I'm pleased to see seems to be moving into, into our past, but it certainly is, is still there and we must be very cautious of it, is that we had some great electronic companies in the UK in the past, but they all died. Um, the electronic systems, act, uh, things that we were, uh, uh, that I was illustrating on the previous slides, were all effectively the results of cultures which are out there and none of our, none of our own activities. There were fabs in the UK, they also died and went. Um, iPhone does nothing to uh, help with the, this illusion because uh, all of the politicians have one and they're looking at the back. They find that they were designed in California and assembled in China, so this only goes to reinforce the, the view that there is nothing left in England to do. Any business in electronics in the UK is just working out the remains of failed industries. These are all common understandings. Um, the UK lost every aspect of electronics opportunity, so investing tax money in it would be just a waste of time. So we're not going to do any of that in research or industry or anything else like that. And ARM is known as a, an interesting exception, but it doesn't scale and it's non-repeatable and it's also incomprehensible because nobody really <laughs> understands why we exist at all, actually. Um, so ESCO was created to try and refute this perception with facts. Now, of course, we know that money talks, and the only institutes which are worth saving are financial ones, and so it was important that we actually went forward to quantify some, co some community which is associated with us. And so the ESCO established, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about ESCO, but it is important, ESCO established that this thing that we defined as the UK electronic systems community is 850,000 people in the UK and is con contributing 80 billion to the economy, 5.4%, which is actually right up there with the biggest recognised uh, communities which the government considers are worth prioritising. Automotive is only 0.7%, aerospace 0.4%, construction is 8 creative 3 uh, pharma and bio, not tourism is nine, you know, we're, we're right up there. So all of a sudden it shouldn't come as a surprise to us, but it did come as a surprise that uh, not only is government interested by these numbers, but they believe them. And if they believe them, then they're going to want to do something to help to make it better. And so suddenly we get this big feedback which says, okay guys, looks good, what can we do to help? Now, that's a, a good position to be in. That's a good position to be in. Giving us lots of money is not the answer. We know that. What we need to do is to, is to get the community that we've talked about up here to act as a body to not just benefit the UK but to benefit themselves. Money will help to lubricate this but there's no way that government is going to be able to put up significant percentages of that number it will be able to put oil between the cogs, but it won't be able to put in large values to make this happen. And it would be unrealistic of us to expect to do it. But nevertheless, what we find ourselves looking at here is a success story. Despite the neglect and prejudice that's been working against us for probably the last 20 or 30 years, we are surprisingly healthy. The people who have come through this have gone through a process of evolution based on the dinosaurs of the 20th century electronics industry. 
Uh, that doesn't mean to say that they are all changed, but it does mean to say that the ones that are here are lean, mean, international fighting machines, and they're doing well. We're an unrecognised, uncoordinated community with a huge potential to deliver more. So that's the status that we're in right now. We're still unco unre well, sorry, we're still unrecognised by lots of people, or the politicians now know we're here. We're uncoordinated still, though, so we can do something about that. But we offer a huge potential to improve, and of course, if we improve 5% of the UK GDP, then that puts us not amongst the contenders, but ahead of the contenders. And that's where we should be, because we know electronic systems are going to be the basis of pretty well all of the technology in the later parts of the 21st century. So 2020 and beyond, everything about us will be depending on electronic systems. <coughs> ah, excuse me. Also, ESCO also pointed out the strategic importance of electronic systems to the ongoing health of the UK economy. Not surprising, politicians are interested in this. You take electronics, electronic systems out of things and you're going to have a far bigger collapse than the banks could ever manage. The banks, after all, depend on electronic systems for their, finan for their financial wheelings and dealings, shady and otherwise. <coughs> So the importance of, and practicality of establishing international codependence. So we can't do all of the electronic systems ourselves in the UK, but we can have important roles in developing them. And it's important to establish that we have mutual level of dependency because we can't establish absolute independence. And that is something which is attainable. Electronic systems are global products. We need to develop national capabilities within the technologies, not just for the whole thing. And the technology businesses, which will inevitably re remain beyond the understanding of most non-technically educated, are still valuable businesses. So we have to bear that in mind. And when we're talking to these ordinary people, we have to recognize that they don't understand the languages that we're talking. <coughs> It is a 21st century child, so the thing that we have created, the 35,000 businesses spread around the, the country doing their own particular things, it is a 21st century child. It's competitive internationally because it's, it's born of the internet and it uses the internet and the ICT environment. It will succeed in the UK or elsewhere. These industries are not industries which are strongly bound to a geographic area. And so it's important that the government realises this in particular. If it wants to make its investment, the investment is to encourage these people to do the development of what they do in the UK rather than elsewhere. Now I've used these people. I wish I could use this pointer. I've used the term these people so far, I've not actually talked about who they are. So some terms to get used to. Electronic systems are human level products whose functionality fundamentally rests on or depends on the electronic technologies that lie underneath it. Yeah, it's a kind of self-evident. You are part of this community if you have a UK footprint uh, involved in the UK doing things of this nature. You work in some parts of the science, technology or technology life cycle in their methods, components and manufacture except for the overt exploitation or direct maintenance. So if you're, if you're in the business of solely exploiting internet technology then you're not actually in the, tech, in the, IC, in the electronic systems activity. Um, but it includes fundamental science, manufacturing, technology support, all technologies active in this area. And your department, if you work in Tesco's and yet you're working on the, uh, their ICT, their communications activities, or you're in a department which is known for something else and yet you have an activity in there which is electronic systems, then you're part of this community. So I put the welcome home badge because you've never had a home before. And it, generally speaking, if you feel you're part of this community, then you are part of this community. So if the thing that you're doing makes you feel good about yourself is electronic systems, then stand up, wave the flag, grab the banner, stand behind it, and join this community, because we're all in it together for the first time. It's a good strength and a good place to be. Now, Moore's Law, we mustn't forget, yet we do. It's a small point. 
But when ARM was formed back in 1991, an integrated circuit that we were developing was around a million transistors. Today, you can buy 20 billion transistors for a fiver. In fact, that's even a small uh, memory card these days. That's 20,000 times more functionality on a chip in 20 years. Now, anybody who thinks that we're using the same techniques today to design chips as we did 20 years ago is deluded. We've had to evolve hugely our design methodology and that hasn't happened overnight. It's design methodology. We still have tools. The tools still look much the same. They still look like computers. But actually the whole methodology, the whole environments, the groupings into departments and the activities that go on in those departments are fundamentally different. They didn't come about by accident. They came about because of research. Research within a thriving economy then is a necessary part of staying put, keeping going with this, this, uh, this roller coaster ride that we've been having for the last 30 plus years involves a, a, a continued investment in research. It's important that industry realizes that, but it's also important that you realize that what you're doing does feed into a product future. It's important for the UK, it's important for uh, businesses in general, because we're all international, what you do doesn't have to be restricted to the UK. It's up to the government to make sure that it gets the maximum UK bang per buck back, back out of this. So from a company's point of view, however, first of all, this is not a basket case. Uh, the UK sector is very live and it's, and it's thriving, so all of a sudden it matters that, it's, um, that it gets supported properly. Now, fundamentally, before a company commences actually any product development, it needs to know that it can succeed. Now, you think about that for a moment. Companies can't afford to fail, because if they fail once these days, they really don't get a second chance. It's out of the door, your competitors have got you. So before they make any commitment to develop a product, they have to know that it can succeed, which essentially means there are some things that have to be found out before they can start the development of a new product which is in some way dependent on technology let's say they have to find that out before they can start the development process that's what research means to industry and we'll come back to it so it's not the end of the story it needs knowledge and installed capabilities in all of the domains there are many of them that it will traverse en route to a successful product so it can be a little thing like, I don't know how to handle foreign goods transactions, therefore I can never sell my product outside of the UK. That's a research question which needs to be answered. It's nothing to do with technology, but it's very much to do with business. So some of the uh, research that industry wants to do is from the known set. Some people know how to do this already, we don't. It could be synthesis. Some people know how to do this, but we don't. It could be C or C++ or one of the higher level languages. Uh, these are not all unknowns. They're, they're frequently unknowns to a business. And businesses try to get this from conferences and from talking to people, from espionage perhaps, uh, specialist tools, buying and training, licensing, purchasing, employing, acquisition. These are all ways of delivering the capabilities that companies need. Um, it also needs to see beyond this, but it doesn't always realize why. Uh, primarily, three to five years out is tomorrow's problem. Businesses are usually very focused on getting something out. Uh, and three to five years is their next product, not this one. Uh, and whereas it would be nice to think about the future, because they hope that they're going to have one, uh, right now their problem is to get the product out or they won't have one. So fundamental research, science, predictability, useful fundamentals are necessary, just not right now. So five plus years becomes a threshold of caring as far as, in, as far as industry is concerned. And of course, for research activities, a lot of these things are the area that you work on. So we have to recognize that these are different communities with different briefs, but that doesn't mean to say they're incompatible. So let's look <coughs> and see what we can see. So what leads markets then is their market. Not other people's markets, not what other people tell them are good markets, but the markets effectively that they can access. So starting where they are, 
what's a reasonable development from where I am in terms of the customers that I can address, in terms of the products that I can offer into that market. Because, you know, I, I may be excellent at, at integrated circuits today, but, uh, you know, going into, um, into cream scones may be a little bit of a technology bridge too far. As far as the investors are concerned, they'd look at the company and say, hey, these guys have lost the plot, um, let's take our money out altogether. So it may just be that you, the, that odd six-inch furnace that you've got left is not applicable to, to cream scones manufacture, even though it could be. Commercially viable product is the objective all of the time. So industries can't change their spots overnight and charity and society is a nice concept. Um, industry isn't about charity or society, it's about making money and you shouldn't forget that. Nobody should forget that. Academic research on the other hand is inquiry led, it's not a commercial objective, its output is science, maybe tending towards technology. But profs similarly can't change their spots overnight. You can't become an expert on uh, one domain if you've spent the last 20 years working on another domain. There are other people who've spent 20 years working on that other domain. You're going to be behind the game overnight. And, and competition in this domain is just as international as it is in the industry. Exploitation in an academic concept, well, it's a messy distraction, isn't it? You know, you're all told you've got to do it, but you don't really want to. Um, government, on the other hand, is society and geographically led. Uh, it's probably the only group who's actually aware of the shape of the UK. Uh, everybody else is busily working on what they're doing, but to government, the shape of the UK matters. You know, whether Southern Ireland or Northern Ireland is in, you know, it matters. Society. Government is interested in society. Inter interestingly, society isn't interested in society, but government is. Society, society doesn't behave as a body. Society behaves as, in the UK, 60 million individuals who are all very selfish. Uh, society, so if there is going to be any kind of societal lead, it has to come from the government because society isn't going to give it. So there is a chasm of misunderstanding between all of these groups. And what we have to do is, of course, to work to get rid of those chasms. Now, we've done something to get rid of some of the, ca some of the misunderstandings uh, between government and uh, industry and academia in, uh, in, in ESCO. Um, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we've also we've got uh, problems which come about as people try to simplify the, uh, uh, the understanding of these chasms and probably the, um, one of the uh, uh, great illustrations of this comes from the idea that government says that soci society's challenges are a great market opportunity. I hear this a dozen different ways in the Commission, from the UK, whatever. Actually society's challenges are a great market opportunity for somebody, yeah but not necessarily for anybody who works in the UK, uh, in the industry, or in academia, actually. Uh, we're always being told this, but it's not strictly true. The biggest markets, the biggest market opportunities, have never been predicted by government. So what's government up to? Though driven by a societal need, the biggest marketing developments today, the internet, tablets, IoT, are not aligned with societal challenges at all. So the, most of where industry is developing its activities has nothing to do with society's challenges. So what's going on here? What they are is actually where government will be spending lots of money. Now logically enough, if government is spending money there, they're doing it to address a market failure, so it's not something which would happen naturally. And where there is money, there is opportunity. But the best business opportunities will probably occur in a myriad of cross-cutting technologies that are also applicable to society's challenges that are also applicable to society's challenges. So we're not going to fundamentally change our spots. Thank you for this information, government, but actually we'll decide where we're going. That's good. It's good if you're in industry because you can afford to say that. Not quite the same if you're in the research community, of course, because uh, they hold your purse strings, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, that is. Um, so now we have to help them to see we industry have to help them to see that what you're doing is important part of the UK's electronics ecosystem because if they see that you are an important part of it then and they also realize that we have a significant value to the UK then they are going to listen to us so your future is dependent on our success 
in persuading the government of how successful UK electronic systems community is and how you are an important part of it. Then they'll leave you alone because they want to encourage the 5.4% 5, 5 to become 10%. They, all have, they have images which are higher than ours. And to do that then, we both have to understand more about each other. So industry has to understand academia and academia has to understand industry. And we've got to come some way to, bring, to, to bridge the gaps that are going to occur in it. Now I put this one up because it's a, an illustration. It's true that markets do provide the business opportunities, um, but these, these business opportunities that are presented here None of them talk about society's challenges. So these are the things, the areas, which within a business, and this particular business is ARM, uh, within a business, these domains become relevant. Now, it's, you have to remember that it's the end customer who actually funds all of the life cycle of any product. So it, you're funded by the people who ultimately buy the iPhones. You're far down the chain, but you're in there. So ARM has, of course, a map great with uh, illustrations of the sort of products that it goes into, but actually we don't design things to go into those products. It's our customers and our partners who buy our technology and who incorporate those into the products. We have a map which shows a genuine figure of 150 billion, cumulative figure of 150 billion ARM CPUs shipped by, by 2020. And just to give you a scale on that, we shipped nearly 9 billion last year, a number which is growing by 20% 20, 20 per annum. 75% of the things connected to the internet are arm powered. That surprised me when I heard it. But the point about it is, none of those things were addressing directly society's challenges, although a power efficient ARM CPU, the availability of electronics, smart electronics to go into the components which are going to be around all of those uh, Internet of Things is undoubtedly valuable. Our product is going to head into the Internet of Things and the Internet of Things is going to help with society's challenges. There are at least three levels of abstraction in there which have to be included. Now the other chasm which tends to be referred to on a fairly regular basis is this chasm between research and innovation. So this excludes the one which is the chasm between uh, those two communities and government and for the moment we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ignore that. But it's illustrated as a fairly straightforward research innovation chasm and uh, various, the Commission have, have produced documents which show this and the, uh, the UK government have produced documents which show this. There is an implicit link between innovation and product which is quite assumed and quite wrong. And there is also an implicit outcome that if you take research and you sort of push it hard enough, it will become product. And so therefore, as they have control over your purse strings, they're telling you increasingly that what, you're, what you have to do is to push your research outcomes closer to a product. And then industry can be blamed if it doesn't pick up that product and run with it. Well, of course, it's a, it's a gross simplification and it's wrong. Unfortunately, it leads to the obvious cure, which is drive your national research base closer to the exploitation base. But the truth is far more complex, and not surprisingly, so is the cure. There are at least three gaps that I've, I use to illustrate here. The gap between science and technology, technology and capability, and capability and product. But it's actually more complex than that as well, because... In reality, single sciences seldom map onto single products. We're not talking about a science becoming a technology, becoming a capability, becoming a product. A product depends on a range of capabilities, one of which may be new. A capability may be dependent on several technologies, one of which may be new. And then indeed, a technology may depend on several sciences, one of which may be new. And of course, the inverse also applies. A single product inevitably depends on many sciences. So this one-to-one-ism, this one which is simplified here, is just far too simple. But what it means when you look at a product like this, which you're all familiar with, is there's a, a wide range of technologies. Methodology and me uh, methods, metrology and tools are part of it, along with, this, with identifiable technologies. Um, we mustn't forget that mechanics, plastics and glass are important parts of making something like this work and their technologies as well. Many businesses all around the world, not least of which are from the UK. 
So it's not the UK doing the whole thing. It's not illustrated in the background as manufactured in China, designed in California. It's a worldwide activity which just happens to have those two as the final assembly <coughs> domains. So looking at this then, the chasm between these is handled by industry, avoiding gaps by using known science, technology and capa uh, uh, capabilities as far as possible. So these gaps are here, and for an industry that can't afford to go wrong, and, no ca and none can, then it chooses to do as, uh, use as many capabilities as it already knows and, ha and knows how to do, and introduce as few new ones as it can possibly get away with, and only uses the ones which offer the biggest quantifiable benefit to the end product. It avoids gaps to the left, so gaps which are further down the life cycle it really doesn't want to have if it, if it can avoid it. It, really, it may like the look of that science, but if it's got to go some way before it becomes technology and some more way before it becomes capability and some more way before it can embed it into the product, it's too risky. It can go wrong. <clears throat> Innovation is all about using what you know how to do. Well, that's an unpopular thing. Governments don't like that message, actually, because innovation is associated with research in so many people's minds. Innovation, product innovation, is about new, knowing about using what you already know how to do in a novel way to create a product which is differentiated from your competitors. It used to be called sweat your assets, but obviously we need a new term these days, and we call it innovation. So... Academia can anticipate the best potential business uses of science wherever, whatever, and wherever. So not just microelectronics, and not just in the UK. If the most logical outcome from your research activity is clothing activities in India, don't fight it. The biggest contribution you can make to the UK's economy is by employing people here in the UK, and if you do that by exporting your science, then that's a good thing to do. Far better than just see it flounder or let somebody else develop it. If there is an opportunity to develop it in the UK, then develop it in the UK. Quantifying the value of a science when it's used in a particular life cycle is also important because industry wants to measure the result of its effort. If it puts this effort in, how, is it, how does it know how much it's going to appear as a benefit in its product at the end of the day? Again, it can't afford to get it wrong. You don't have to be 100% right You've just got to have a feel for it, because a feel for it is better than nothing. Of course, you have to establish business contacts and bridge those early stage gaps. They don't have to be fully engineered structures, but they have to be getting something ready to be used, at least in a demonstration capability that a company can incorporate into their product before they become heavily dependent on it, totally dependent on it. And those who know me have heard this one many times before. Order of magnitude. What you're looking for, by the time it's been uh, moderated by going through these processes, by the time, if you're talking science, and you're talking science to, a, uh, to a, a, a company who is making a business out of it, then you've got to be looking for, at this stage, an order of magnitude improvement over the status quo. That can be a, a composite of power, efficiency, size, or anything else of that nature. But if it's less than 10, it's not worth the effort. 10 is worth getting out of bed for. If you have 10, you may have 5 or 3 by the time it eventually makes it into a product, but 3 is still worth having. If you start off with 3, you end up with 1 by the time it gets to a product, and it's just not worth the effort. So you have to have, you've got to think your times 10s. So universities need industry. They need industry to guide the direction, of exploit direction and exploitation of research programs. Um, not specifically for the businesses who are providing you the direction, incidentally, nor specifically for UK uh, companies. They also need them to help fund research. 100% funding is always favourite, and it does happen. It happens when industry sees that there is something here which is quite directly aligned to their business. It may need some additional work on it then industry will find money for it. If it's speculative and it's not aligned to product, then forget it. You know, the money just isn't there, or at least it's significantly tinier. Part-sponsored schemes, which are great. EPSRC does a splendid job on this. Um, support for national funding, that's where it mentions it. Uh, strategic, strategic relationship values. Universities like to have 
the equivalent of an arms centre of excellence, something which is associated with an industry, a local industry. It looks good on their CV and it undoubtedly helps them with proposals that they make. But you also have to remember that 95% of the exploitation opportunities are going to be outside of the, K of the UK. It's just a matter of uh, GDP and it's a scale of the, uh, of the GDP which is from the UK. We're 1% of the world's population, 5% of the world's GDP. It's unreasonable to expect that, uh, that if more than 5% of the exploitation happens in the UK, then you're, then you're becoming unreasonable in your expectations. 5% is a good number, and I was pleased to see uh, Derek said that earlier this morning. Don't overhype what you've got. Be realistic. It's usually science and technology. It's not capability. It's not going to make a product. But the industrialist will appreciate that you're telling them that it is a science and technology, and they appreciate that they will need to, to do work on it to help to get it to the other sense. If you force them to take it, then you'll have one working relationship and it might have money in it, but you won't have another one. Um, industry is always short-sighted, however. It can misdirect and mislead or misuse you. Give them a chance. If you're going to provide some cheap labour to, to solve a problem that they have today, then they will quite happily use you to do it. It's your local GDP contribution, and that is proportional to the people that you employ locally you or the people who exploit your technology. So that's the way to measure your contribution. It's not what revenue you get in from grants or anything like that. And from a company point of view, it's not what their overall takings are or where they pay their tax. It's down to the number of people that they employ inside a geographic region. There's nothing wrong with maximizing the UK contribution to this. It doesn't have to be contradictory to the industry or to your uh, department's uh, interests. Industry needs universities to guide their expectations of emerging science. Yeah. What are we supposed to believe about uh, um, uh, graphene and uh, neurons and neural technology? We've got nobody else to ask except you. Why shouldn't we ask you? Establish a good relationship with you because you give us straightforward answers. Um, well, maybe I didn't get a straightforward answer this morning. Who knows? In the portfolio, providing answers ahead of its product needs. So industry needs universities to provide answers ahead of its product needs. Portfolio is an interesting word. Industry is always going to hedge its bets as much as possible. As I said before, it's going to purchase, license and contract tools, methods and objects. But it also needs to educate, to build, acquire, employ, business know-how and knowledge. Some of it will do in-house, some of it will do via partnering, and some of it will support basic research activities to achieve. But what you notice here is the pounds, pounds activities. The basic research, it wants to support lots of them, but there's no money available. The partnering activities, it'll have medium activities on reasonably tight budgets, frequently self-funded. In-house activities, however, these are strategic technologies to address actual product shortfalls in knowledge. There will be fewer of those, but they won't have any shortage of money. All of these activities represent opportunities that universities can, can address instantly. And I'll come back to the educate one on the next slide. Remember, the closer to a product, the more valuable the service. And because 99% of universities are outside the UK, and as answers matter, not sources, then industry is quite happy to get these answers anywhere, not just from inside the UK. So industry also contributes to GDP by its employment, local and global. And again, nothing wrong with maximizing the UK component of it. But the UK also needs uh, in universities to provide education for its employees. Now it's, it's kind of popular in some ideas, in, in some domains, that you get yourself a degree, you get yourself a master's or a doctorate and you're set up for life. This is it, you can become an engineer and you'll never have to work again. Uh, those of us who are engineers, however, know that this is quite a different story. It is actually a life of challenge and a life of learning, and actually, it's quite enjoyable. But actually, if you sell that right up here and say to you guys, you're not actually just getting this degree, what you're actually getting is the first rung on a ladder. You're getting enough of the language and the context to be able to start a career. And the careers develop, people need to be trained and retrained to undertake the work expected of them and the career path that they choose. Which basically means the biggest educational opportunity 
is in the through life activity, in the postgraduate through life activities. Universities have a huge opportunity here to provide the initial training, to provide the leading edge postgrad training aligned with their research. So hey, that also gives a researcher context as well. And via employment pathways or courses, leaving a commercial enterprise is to look after the mid-ground. Nothing's stopping a university setting itself up as a commercial enterprise to support this mid-area. But a lot of the mid-area stuff here might include specific training on specific t commercial tools and so on. So industry needs people who can do the work. And this is an important thing to remember. Formal qualifications are not a prerequisite in this area. Uh, so if somebody can do the job, it doesn't matter what bits of paper they've got. Education only increases the prob probability that you will be suited to a new role. So the quality of the education matters, the stickability of the education matters, and, the, um, and, and its alignment with the new role matters. Because if you teach somebody something which is not associated with where they're going to go, then it doesn't actually help them up the ladder. So the ability to target specifically uh, education activities is another area where research, where universities have an opportunity. Engineering is a life of challenge and a life of learning, so enjoy. So we come back to ESCO because it's inevitable that it's in here. The main thing about this is pretty well if you're in this room I have no problem with, with saying that you are an important part of this community. You came along because you're interested in it. ESCO gives us identity, social value, community, and a voice. I want to spend a moment just talking about that. Identity. We know we can, ha we can be seen outside. Government knows that electronic systems community is something. It didn't know we existed before. It's a, it's a message that can be pervaded to the people. Those, those issues about those illustrations of electronic systems in their life and all around, they can be passed to people. The societal value, we've shown how much we're contributing to the economy. That's what matters in many ways. But the other thing that matters is it's a growing economy. It's a career opportunity. It's a community. You can stand behind this flag and you can tell people, I work in the UK electronic systems community and feel quite proud about it. Whereas before you might have been working on oxide deposition on gallium arsenide silicon and nobody has any idea what you're talking about. And it gives us a voice. It gives us an opportunity to talk to people as a body. We do have to have something to say, however. Uh, so that's the next phase of this problem and the ESCO Council and the Executive and the working groups will be the mechanisms to make that happen and you will have plenty of opportunity to participate. Don't feel because you're not, your door isn't being knocked on today that it won't be knocked on. It will be knocked on. So, in conclusion then, the UK has a strong and vibrant electronic systems community. The numbers have, I've said before and I won't dwell on them anymore. But it's a tale of successful evolution from the 20th century predecessors. This is the nature of 21st century business. That's the message. Get used to it. That applies to you and to other people. Believe it. Believe it. Those are the numbers. Those are the people. That is the contribution. We are important. If you don't believe it, you'll never persuade anybody else to believe it. Electronic Systems Community gives us those identity, social value, community and voice. The council and executive are just up and running. Your opportunity to, to get involved will be coming soon. And for your, for your and the community's sake, grasp that opportunity with both hands. It will benefit you, it will benefit you as individual researchers, it will also benefit you in your life. You'll be able to go home and you'll be able to talk to your mum and you'll be able to say, Mum, I work in electronic systems. And she'll know what you're talking about. Your wife will understand you when you go home. Fancy that. <coughs> She's never been able to understand me, but my wife does kind of get the electronic systems message these days. I practice on her a lot. <coughs> Because the UK electronic systems is not a basket case, then it matters that it develops. It's so important that we realise it's not a basket case. That's what it's been for too long. It's not anymore. If it's an important part of the economy, then it matters. We must demonstrate that the industry needs academia and, and vice versa. That is an important link and we, need, we both need to work on it. And we do that by associating with electronic systems. We must make that relationship work though, it's not just uh, paper exercise 
And to do that, we must both work to understand each other. And finally, building a culture of success is going to be a really difficult thing for us because we're Brits. Okay? Now the good news about this is there's a large international uh, presence starting to appear. I like the Glaswegian Russians, was it? The Russian, Russian, Geordies. Russian, Russian Geordies, I like that. Uh, but I think we're, we, are, uh, we are becoming a more diversified culture. Uh, but nevertheless, this British ethos of self-doubt and, uh, and pushing ourselves down and never claiming our strengths or anything like that is something we've got to overcome. Stand on the, do- on the hilltops and wave your flag. You're part of the electronics, UK electronic systems community and you're jolly well proud of it. And we're going to make it happen. Work on it, guys. Work on it, guys. And the Russians, I expect to work on the Brits, okay? It's a new dawn, and the outlook is great. Thank you for listening.